Economics of Class Collaboration by Earl Browder, published March 1924. Intellectual poison for the workers is the only judgment possible on the book The Control of Wages, recently issued by the Workers' Education Bureau and written by Walton Hamilton and Stacy May. Cleverly written and avoiding much of the dry and humorless style usually in such books, the philosophy of class collaboration that it contains is all the more dangerous to the labor movement. It bears the same relation to trade union theory that the collaboration schemes of W. M. H. Johnston and company bear to trade union practice. It amounts in substance to an elaborate scheme of justification in the language of economic science for the prostitution of labor unionism to the function of efficiency auxiliaries to capitalism. The hope is held out, as bayed upon the class collaboration hook, that by these means the labor unions may raise the prevailing standard of wages. Production and Wages The fundamental thesis of Hamilton and May is contained in the following words, quote, It'll be well to remember that there are only two ways in which the material welfare of the laborer can be increased. One is at the expense of our groups in the community. The other is through an increase of the wealth out of which all income is paid. The first of these has very definite limits. If it is overdone, it defeats its own end. The second of these, an attempt to get more out of resources through increased efficiency and technical improvements, has flexible limits. End quote. Throughout the book, grave warnings of disaster and disappointment are given to those workers who would increase wages at the expense of property incomes, while the smooth, broad road to comfort and affluence for all workers is described in proposals for increasing the production of industry. The class struggle is anathema. The key to wages is class collaboration. Such is the message of the Workers' Education Bureau and its textbook on wages. It is interesting to note the similarity between these theories and those which have brought disaster to the German labor movement, when at the close of the war, German labor had the opportunity to establish a real control of wages by means of militant class struggle and subordination of the capitalist class. It was lured away by the siren song of, first, we must re-establish the forces of production. Under the leadership of the class collaborationists and the Social Democratic Party and trade union officialdom, the German workers subordinated themselves to the task of repairing the capitalist system, increasing production, and improving the technique of industry. The present mass starvation of the German working class is the direct outcome of this policy. Its effects in America can only differ in degree. Some disconcerting facts. What is the answer of American experience to the question of whether increased production is a source of increased wages? Hamilton and May themselves give figures on page 145 to 146, which belie the conclusions of their argument. Production increased in the United States from 1899 to 1920 by approximately 30% per capita. But during the same period, real wages, instead of increasing by any part of the increased production, actually declined to an extent variously estimated at 10% to 30%. It is hard to obtain any comfort for the class collaborationists from these stubborn facts. What has American experience to say as to the effectiveness of improved industrial technique in raising wage rates? According to the theory of Hamilton and May, the most highly organized and mechanized industries should pay the highest wages. A casual comparison between wages in the steel industry, where organization and machine process are developed to a high degree, with those in the building industry which, although rapidly undergoing the same transformation, is still, for various reasons, far behind steel, shows that the collaborationist theory is not supported by existing facts. A bulletin of the Bureau of Labor Statistics, December 1923, shows the average wage of workers in the steel industry for one particular week to be approximately $5 per day, while the monthly labor review of the same bureau for December 1923 shows the wage rates in building trades for all the large cities, which together comprise the bulk of the building workers, to range from $8 to $13 per day. It is a matter of common knowledge that they enjoy infinitely better working conditions, have more control of their jobs, etc. 
the building trades workers have shorter hours and receive higher wages than do the workers in the steel industry. Improved technique has not been a source of increased wages. The above facts and arguments are convincing testimony that increased production and development of technique have no tendency to increase wages. It might be argued with more plausibility that the opposite of the collaborationist theory is true. Either statement of the case, however, ignores the fundamental factors that determine wages, both as discovered by theoretical analysis and direct observation. It is as incorrect for the workers to expect increased wages by increased output as it would be for them to go upon the opposite theory and attempt to limit production and prevent technical progress for the purpose of increased wages. Effects of collaboration Upon the labor movement, the effect of the collaborationist theory is to undermine and destroy what measures of control the workers have over wages. A classical example of this is seen in the scheme of W.M. H. Johnston, president of the Machinist Union, now being peddled to the railroad corporations of the country, by which the labor organizations are to abandon all struggle with the companies, become efficiency bureaus, and make the employers love them. Two positive results are achieved by such surrender to class collaboration. One, the employers are thus won to affectionate regard for the unions, because it saves them the trouble of creating company unions for the same purpose. Two, the reactionary officials of the unions avoid unpleasant struggles, preserve their easy jobs and comfortable salaries, and become respectable citizens. But if these class collaboration theories, together with the vicious practices that naturally follow from them, serve the interest of the employing class and the union bureaucracy, their effect upon the working class is disastrous. Its fighting spirit, as well as its ability to put up an effective fight, are gradually and subtly undermined. The unions are transformed step by step into production departments, and the authority of capitalist administration begins to reach over from the workshop into the union hall. Labor as an independent power, fighting the encroachments of predatory capitalism and jealously protecting the interests of the workers, is eliminated from industry. Class collaboration is fatal to militant labor organization. Not only does this pernicious doctrine sap the strength of the trade unions, but at the same time it increases the fighting power of the employers. How ridiculous it is to tell the workers that their wages are to be increased through improvements in the technique of production, when all about them they see that it is precisely the most highly mechanized industries that have eliminated effective labor unionism and used the higher technique to intensify exploitation of the workers. The steel trust is a classical example, not to speak of the textile trust, the automobile combines, the rubber industry, and others. Every advance in the technique of industry is accompanied by concentration of capital, which is immediately translated into more militant and effective warfare upon the workers' organizations. The labor market, a pitiful attempt to make class collaboration policies appear to be sound in economic theory, was made by W. M. H. Johnston in his speech before a gathering of railroad executives in St. Louis last fall. His statement that, quote, The idea underlying our service may be compared to the idea which underlies the engineering service extended to the railroads by large supply corporations, which have contracts with these railroads to furnish, let us say, arch brick, superheaters, stokers, or lubricating oil, end quote, is a clumsy attempt to hook his various scheme up with current notions of economics. It attempts to make class collaboration appear as good as selling tactics on the labor market, but the argument fails as miserably as do the others. Wages are determined by the same law which regulates the price of any other commodity, said Karl Marx in Wage, Labor, and Capital, Cur Edition, page 19. The principle is elaborately worked out in capital, being a fundamental of the Marxian theory of value. The prices of a commodity is determined by its cost of production, which is the same thing as its determination by the duration of the labor required for its manufacture. In the case of the commodity, Labor power, the price wage, is determined by the amount of labor required to produce and reproduce it. 
This is subject to variation from the barest subsistence or less to the comparative comfort of small sections of workers according to the technical requirements of the labor process, the immediate supply and demand, the general level of technology, etc., but above all according to the organized social and industrial power of the workers to withhold their labor power from the market until they receive a certain standard of living. The only effective point of attack for the workers is their efforts to control wages is thus clearly seen to be their organized power used in struggle with the employers. To attempt to find in the examination of labor power as a commodity any justification for the Johnson scheme of increasing the productivity of labor power as a policy for the raising of wages is absurd. To propose the increase of the price of labor power by increasing its productivity, which in turn increases the available supply in relation to the demand of industry, while the control of the supply by its sellers is weakened. Such a proposition is a caricature of economic theory that scarcely requires refutation. When the collaborationists point out that wage rates are generally higher in those countries with a highly developed machine industry than in countries where primitive methods prevail, they think they have scored a smashing argument that labor can afford to lead in the popular drive for more production. No such conclusion is warranted by an examination of the matter. Higher wages in countries of machine production, as compared with countries of handicraft industry, have the same meaning so far as wages and their control go, as the figures for equipment repairs and maintenance. Both items are higher in the one country than in the other, and for the same reason, maintenance costs are higher for a steam engine than for a hand loom and the labor maintenance cost is higher for a steam engine operator than for a hand loom operator. Neither has any necessary relation to the volume of production. Both are incidental to the technical requirements of the particular industry, and both increase parata with the increase of production upon a given level of technical culture in the absence of compensating factors. Class struggle, the only way. Control of wages is, indeed, a vital problem to the working class, but unfortunately, there is no broad, well-lidded boulevard that leads the workers to that much-desired goal. It can be reached only by organization and struggle. All the attempts of the apostles of class peace, class collaboration, and social reformism to lead the workers away from the inevitable fight are in result, if not in intention, gross betrayals of the interest of the working class. Control of wages is to be obtained only through control of the whole process of production, which in turn calls for the control of government. Every specific wage is to be increased only by organization and struggle in the shops. The general wage is to be controlled only through the widest political organization and struggle of the whole working class. Class struggle and not class collaboration leads to the emancipation of the toiling masses.